This could be something quite sensational. Right out of the top draw. Six games from the Ladbrokes Premiership tonight as the season moves into October. Here to usher in a sparkling autumn of action, Michael Stewart and Stephen Thompson. The Kilmarnock Sunshine destination number one this evening. Aberdeen arrived in Ayrshire off the back of a massive victory against Rangers. The home side struggling at the wrong end of the table after a 6-1 thumping from Celtic last weekend. But they did have one thing in common. Both sides know all about spectacular goals. Largest single. Boom. Perfect. That was unsavable. You couldn't fit any better than that. Fantastic. Goal of the month. Kulabali, let's whip! Oh my god, yeah. And there's the straight. With Kilmarnock's Dean Hawkshaw injured against Celtic and out for the next few months, Charlie Adams takes his place in midfield. The return of the fit again, Greg Kilty sees Nathan Tyson drop to the bench. Aberdeen also make two changes. Ash Taylor returns to central defence at the expense of Mark Reynolds and the inclusion of the talented James Madison sees Peter Pollitt drop out. Madison playing the free kick short to McGinn. And Jamie McDonald right behind that one. Killy happy to get it clear. A good strike from again. Certainly warmed the fingers of the commander keeper. It's Considine. Madison. Neat pass through. And McDonald was there again to thwart Johnny Hayes. Taking it on the turn. Bruni looking for that one. Drops away of Hayes. Away from Taylor, here's Rooney, Rooney again, now O'Connor, trying the volley, the central defender up supporting the attack, and Rooney with a chip across, O'Connor just couldn't finish. Madison is at the heart of everything at the moment for Aberdeen, here's Rooney, chipping it through, Jim McDonald gets there, and clattered by Madison. Well, Willie Collum is given a penalty for McDonald seemingly pulling back on Madison, but the keeper was already fouled by the Aberdeen player. Here's Rooney with the strike. And Adam Rooney puts Kilmarnock in front in the 25th minute. In controversial circumstances, it's his third goal in his last three appearances against Kilmarnock for Rooney. And it's his sixth goal of the campaign. Kilmarnock looking to get themselves back into this. Dicker in towards Boyd. He's looking for a penalty in that challenge from Considine. He's asking questions of the referee. Is that worthy of a penalty? Rooney, in towards Madison, nice bit of footwork again from Madison, excellent defending there by Greg Taylor to thwart Graham Shinney coming in at the back post, but Madison certainly is an entertainer. Madison with the corner, there's Taylor in there, it breaks away of Considine! And Aberdeen have doubled their leads. And it's Andrew Considine getting his first goal of the season. And a terrific volley it was at the back post. Not picked up. And he blasted it beyond McDonald. Koulibaly. He's got three goals in his last three appearances. He's trying again. Well, 
curled that one in, but just too wide of the target. But he is another exciting player. Shinny. He's done well finding Rooney. Jamie McDonald had to keep his eye on that one. Just tipping it over. Sun in the goalkeeper's eyes at the moment. Did well though. Madison with the corner. There's Ash Taylor on the volley. And the central defender has put Aberdeen 3 0 in front. Good delivery again by Madison, but poor defending from Kilmarnock and an excellent volley from Taylor. Here's McGinn. Through towards Rooney. Dicker couldn't get it. And Rooney sclaffed his effort. Well, that really was a great opportunity for Rooney to increase Aberdeen's lead. Rooney. Here's Madison. Taylor always oh, tried to pass back. He's given it straight to Rooney. Well, Adam Rooney could have had a hat trick in this game, but he still only got one. Here's Hayes. Good skills from Johnny Hayes. Now through to Adam Rooney. Can he finish this time? He can. And Aberdeen are 4-0 up. Rooney got his double and his seventh of the season. Well, credit to Johnny Hayes for the assist. But Aberdeen now on course for their 11th successive win against Kilmarnock. When you get beat at home, it's bad enough, but when you get beat by that scoreline, uh, not acceptable. I take full responsibility. You know, these last two results have not been acceptable. Some of the play was sparkling, you know, from that front four at times were excellent, two attacking fullbacks and McLean and Shinney supporting. It was, you know, if you can put in a, a perfect performance, it was almost it. What was your view of the, the penalty decision? Um, listen, it's, in my opinion, it isn't. Um, but we kind of changed the referee's mind. We have to just move on, and uh, we didn't. Well, that was Lee Clark's view of the penalty decision. Only one place we can start the chat about this match. Michael Stewart, what was your analysis of the penalty decision? I mean, simply put, it's not. You know, and look, it, Willie Collins had a lot of criticism from myself from this show in the <laughs> past, and yeah, you know, I don't think this is as blatant as a lot of folk made out. And, you know, we've got a different angle on, on this and we'll show in a minute. Look, Jamie McDonald starts to spill this ball before there's contact, so it's not as if it's because of James Madison coming into him before he pulls him down. But you look at this, the amount of times you realise that decisions are made, look at the number of bodies that are in the way. The referee can't see the initial contact of Madison running into him. Now he's got a better line of sight to see Jamie, uh, Jamie McDonald pulling James Madison down. So it's not a penalty. The Kelly fans are going to be extremely upset, but I can understand why Willie Collum has given that. So sympathy for Willie Collum from Michael Stewart, shocker tonight, Stephen. <laughs> Should have been a free shocker. kick for Kilmarnock. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it was, uh, you know, the initial contact is a foul on Jamie. A good day in terms of goals for Aberdeen. A terrible day at the back for Kilmarnock. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, you look at here, the, it's a simple corner, not picking up, not getting tight enough. A wonderful finish from Andrew Constein. Yeah, it was. It was an excellent finish. And again, from a set piece, this is really poor from Jonathan Byrne. Loses his man, loses Ash Taylor early on, gets wrong side and never really recovers. Tries to have a wee pull at him, but, you know, essentially it's very, very, very poor defending. And the narrative suddenly changes in terms of Aberdeen, doesn't it? Because, well, Michael, we had the, um, the slow start of the season. Suddenly it's scintillating form like this. Yeah, and you see this man, uh, Johnny Hayes, coming in. Look at that gap that uh, Adam Rooney drives into. Defensively, all day, come on, we're really poor. But you're right, that whole sort of narrative of it's been a slow start to Aberdeen the last two weeks, two big results, and all of a sudden they're sitting second in the league. And it's a great start to the season. Come on, it's home form is horrendous. They've tried to narrow the pitch, they've tried to shorten the pitch, they didn't water the pitch yesterday, they put all that black pellets on the pitch. <laughs> there were a lot of those. None of it seems to have worked, Stephen. And, no, it's and a lot of pressure suddenly under Lee Clark. I know there's a lot there of is. things going on behind the scenes at that There point. is, but it's not been good enough. You know, 10 goals in the last two games is nowhere near good enough. They've got to use this international break to get back to basics. You can't leak goals. They're defending in the highlights, as we saw, there was extremely poor. 
back to basics. They'll score goals, Koulibaly and Boyd will get you goals, but you cannot defend like that. How do you feel about the Lee Clark situation, Michael? Because, you know, they lost to Celtic heavily, now they've lost to Aberdeen heavily, and now they've got the international break to stew over all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's not a great time to, to go into the international break, but as you, you know, alluded to there, there's other issues around Kilmarnock, and it, it's, there's been a real general malaise around that club for a good while now. And, yeah, difficulty on the park, but for me, they need to get things sorted off the park first before it's uh, going to be too late and it's got a you know a real uh, bad, bad impact on the club because they're going to be challenging or they're going to be struggling this season down the bottom of the league and can't get relegated because they'll be in big trouble then. Well, Celtic have produced a magnificent performance to come away with a three-all draw with Manchester City in the Champions League on Wednesday night. It was back to the Premiership this weekend an away match to a Dundee side struggling for form. A dense part for us was Liam McLeod. Well, Dundee are desperate to come out of this slump that is threatening their season. Danny Williams and Cami Kerr will play as wing-backs with Kevin Gomez brought into the back line. You may have expected Brendan Rodgers to mix it up a bit after Wednesday's energy-sapping Champions League tie, but he's resisted. Simunovic replaces Toure in their only change. Scott Brown has found Sinclair. It's a good effort. Well, Scott Sinclair looking to keep up this phenomenal goal-scoring run in the Premiership. Wasn't far away. He's had such a good start to life as a Celtic player. Good save, Bain. Dundee really struggling to get into this Celtic. have been all over them. That's Mark O'Hara. It's a useful delivery as well. He almost found Tysa. Lovely ball in by the former Kilmarnock man. Just nicked away here by Simunovic. Paul Hartley going up against Brendan Rodgers for the first time this afternoon. Sinclair's delivery. Bit of pinball. That's Fiatchenko who goes down. It was Kami Kerr's challenge. And the Dean wanted a penalty. Referees Andrew Dallas, not interested. Certainly a big call. Doesn't look as though Cami Kerr's got any of the ball. A minute's applause from both sets of supporters here for Mike Towell, the boxer who tragically lost his life. Forrest, a player reborn this season. Near beat on. No problem for being that time. Watched it all the way. Near Beaton has been known to score a couple from outside the box. Rogic. Celtic bossing the ball. They have done all half. And that's come through here to Sinclair! Well, there's a very late flag. Scott Bain saves. Scott Sinclair just offside. Just. Bain didn't know that. Made the save. Here's Brown. And just opened up for Scott Brown there. He's been back to his best this campaign too. Stephen Gallagher was in Ryder Cup duty a couple of years ago, not involved this time. Celtic fan enjoying the game. Del back two, he crosses and ties our heads over. Well, he feels this came off Sviatchenko. Tierney, nice shuffle away from Kerr, wonderful from Tierney, Sinclair, it's been again and over from Dembele. Well, would Scott Sinclair have been better served leaving this for James Forrest? Lovely cut back by Tierney, who's delivering again. Dundee without a win over Celtic since 2001. Without a win here against them since 1988. This is Dembele. Good footwork. Brown! 1 0. Well, I just mentioned the long, long wait for a win over Celtic for Dundee. And it could be about to be extended here. Scott Brown, three minutes into the second half, gives Celtic the lead. 
and you can't say they don't deserve it. It's been utter domination from the champions. Scott Brown, second of the season, scored against Beersheba in the first leg of their Champions League playoff. Mickey Lowe loses out to Rogic. Here's Forrest. One way, then the other. Sinclair and Dembele! And it stays at 1-0. Moussa Dembele, two goals against Manchester City in midweek. Here's Brown. Probably been Celtic's best player today, the captain. Forrest, left by Griffiths. This is Sinclair! And there's Bain again. A few saves from Scott Sinclair this afternoon. It's Danny Williams, and he's been robbed by Griffiths, who gets the break of the ball. Well, he did have options, but when you're Lee Griffiths and you're inside the penalty box, there's only one thing on your mind, but it stays 1-0. We were in the game all the time. I felt the players were terrific today. Um, we changed the shape. We worked really hard all week and how to stop Celtic. But we were brave today. You know, we went really high against them. Where a lot of teams have been sitting off, dropping off, and letting them have a lot of possession. They did have a lot of possession, but they never really cut us open today. Naturally, there was a little bit of sharpness missing from our game today, with so much, you know, over the course of the last numbers of weeks, and in, the, in particular the game during the week. But it's a great game to win that. You know, as a professional. When you we, we put good possession of the ball, we had to rest when we had the football today. We still created chances, um, but we only needed the one goal. And then I thought after that we defended very, very well. So uh, now a great victory for us. One nil for Celtic. Another three points for the champions. Stephen, after the highs of Wednesday night, how would you sum up that performance? Yes. Well, they dominated possession, as we knew that they would, but they were flat for me, and you can understand that. Wednesday night, the ultimate high of that Man City game, to try and, you know, as a player maker, to try and replicate that again three days it's later... very difficult. Uh, ..is so, so hard, and I personally thought they would have made more changes. You know, they only had one with Toury dropping out. I thought they'd have brought in, well, you know, they've got Armstrong... Well, you, heard, you, heard, you heard, you know, Brendan Rodgers himself saying that naturally there was an element of the sharpness missing from their game, so yeah. I would agree with you that, yeah. you know, in particular at the top end of the park, you know, guys like Griffiths, Roberts, Armstrong, Strong. Guys that are going to bring that sharpness to the game, I'm surprised that they didn't get a, a, a game. You know, keep the solidity and the, the continuity at the back, but, you know, change things up at the front. Yeah, he likes continuity in his side, Brendan Rodgers. In terms of Dundee, Stephen, how much did they bring to the game, did you feel? Not a lot offensively, but they can take positives from the game defensively. I thought they defended very, very well. They changed their shape to a three, and uh, for me, you know, they looked organised. Uh, Paul Hartley touched on the fact that they'd worked on it a lot in, in training. Uh, you know, here you can see they've got 11 men back in the last third, uh, and that was kind of emblematic of the way they played. Uh, they struggled to get forward. One lapse of concentration in the match, really, and this was it. Um, Scott Brown getting the goal, and you can see uh, Scott Brown's desire to get into the box. And he deserves his goal because actually, during the week was the best I've seen him in a long, long time against Man City. He was excellent again yesterday. Uh, and, and deserves his goal. And not, and not only, you know, lapse of concentration from Dundee, for me, that's more about Scott Brown's desire to get in there and have an impact because as, you, as we tracked him there, the midfielder from Dundee had followed him but Scott continued to move and he ended up getting on the end of the ball and, you know, that was all that was needed and you heard again Brendan saying that, that they just needed that one goal yeah. and that was what made it a real professional performance from Scott, Celtic. Scott Brown joking he could be a number 10, Brendan Rogers talking about him possibly <laughs> being a defender in the future. Uh, anyway, we love... A controversial penalty debate, but well, for you guys, nothing controversial. controversial about this. It should have been a penalty. Absolutely. Um, I think it's a crazy decision from Kerr to go into the challenge in the first place. Sviatchenko gets his body across Kerr, and then why he slides in there when Sviatchenko's going nowhere is beyond me. And there's players back in good areas as well for Dundee. You can see his arm goes round him first, then the tackle, doesn't get any of the ball. It's as clear a penalty as you're likely to see. And the, the, the stand side linesman was actually in a really good position. He should have seen it. And even if Kami Kerr gets a foot on the ball, the best that he's going to get is flicking it a yard or two away. It's not even as if he's going to clear his line. So it was a, it was a crazy decision from Kerr to slide in and quite clearly a penalty for Celtic, or just should have been. Just very briefly, Stephen, how concerned should Dundee fans be about this lack of goals from their side? Yeah, the lack of goals is a problem. Uh, you know, in the previous games, they'd lost six goals. So defensively, they've tightened that up against Celtic. They were impressive defensively, yeah. but they've just not managed to replace the two guys that they lost earlier this season, and the goals are going to be a problem for them. OK. 
Well, Ross County had drawn a blank in their last two matches. Admittedly, they'd come uh, away to Hearts and Rangers. Could they get amongst the goals on their home patch? St Johnson, the visitors in Dingwall. Commentary on this one comes from Rory Hamilton. After back-to-back -back scoreless draws away to Rangers and Hearts, Jim McIntyre's had to deal with pre-match injuries to Andrew Davis and Craig Curran. Jay McEvely returns, though, while Greg Morrison makes his first start. St Johnson were unbeaten in the four games against Ross County last season. Michael Coulson and Graham Cummins drop to the bench, while Chris Kane and Stephen McLean are in from the start. It's Liam Craig over the corner kick for St Johnson. And in towards Stephen Anderson. And the new captain in place of the now retired Dave Mackay. Almost opening the scoring. Swanson. And he looks route one over the top, it finds McLean to Kane, blocked by McEvely. Alston continues the attack, then hit by McLean. It's still on for St Johnson. Alston again, and Liam Craig. And it fires just wide. Well, eventually, St Johnson managed to get a clean shot away. Liam Craig almost scoring in back to back games. Craig bursting forward. It's Kane. Picks out Danny Swanson. And it was deflected on its way through. He holds his hand up apologetically to his teammates, but when you're in the form that he's in, you have every right to shoot. It's a third away game in a row for St. Johnson, but they've done not too badly on the road this season. And down goes Kane. It was McEvely's challenge and Crawford Allen points to the spot, it was clumsy as McEvely tangled with Kane and there's no doubt about it, that is a penalty kick. Danny Swanson against Scott Fox and it's calmly done by Swanson, that's eight goals this season, five have come from the spot and it's St Johnson who lead three minutes before half-time. It's a deserved lead for St Johnson to Ross County have not been at the races. Here goes Jonathan Franks though. Forward to Boyce. He's got Martin Woods and Gardine outside him to the left-hand side. Gardine looks to cut in. The shot blocked. Franks can maintain the attack though and he heads down the right-hand side. It's a great ball across by Jonathan Franks but no takers in the middle. Greg Morrison, the 18-year-old, was the closest to it, but nobody could get a touch. It's four without a win for Ross County, three draws in a row. Those two tough away games at Tynecastle and Ibrox, though, as Van der Weg swings it in. Headed clear, only as far as Marcus Fraser. But the volley is easy enough for Xander Clark to hang on to. But it's certainly more encouraging signs for Ross County in this second half. They offered very little in the first 45. That's long towards Boyce, who was brought down by Anderson. Boyce certainly not happy about the challenge. Ross County will have the free kick. It's definitely been better for Jim McIntyre. He can't have been happy at half-time. It's Woods, and it's Ryan Dow's header. Must be the smallest man on the park, but he won the header, making his debut. And tipped over by Xander Clark. Davidson should clear. It's up to Anderson to complete the clearance. McLean. Wotherspoon makes himself available. Swanson now. It's a great ball through to Kane. And St Johnson have their second. A counter-attack goal. And Chris Kane scores for the first time in the league this season. Precision passing. It's Danny Swanson and Chris Kane involved once again as they were in the first goal. The combination works again for Tommy Wright's men. And they have a cushion now. St Johnson did win twice in Dingwall last season. And they're on course for three in a row here. 
It's Chris Burke. And Burke's curling effort is punched away by Clark. Now Van der Weg, and it's touched wide. Well, Burke coming off the bench to also make his debut. And look at Liam Boyce here colliding with Clark. And that is a concerning sight for Ross County fans and also Northern Ireland ahead of the international break. We didn't create enough of great note, you know, a couple of dangerous crosses, but, you know, in, in terms of that, then it was really disappointing. It was a disappointing day all round with the injuries and the result. Pleased to come here. It's not an easy place to come to. And, uh, you know, it's a great start for the league for us and away from home as well. You know, we went to... Uh, Partick and one, we went to Mullerwell and one, and we've had a good point at Hamilton, and now we've come up here uh, and got three points as an uh, excellent return from those away games. We'll get to Ross County's goal drought in a moment, but for St Johnson, joint third on points in the table. Stephen has shown some great form away from home. They are. Uh, you know, that's a big result to go up to Dingwall and get all three points. And last year against Ross County, they were unbeaten, uh, and, and for me, a man that really stood out yesterday uh, was Swanson. I thought he was, he was outstanding. I know we've done a package on him before this season against Motherwell, where he was excellent, but yesterday he was involved in everything positive again for St Johnston. He set up a goal and scored a goal, uh, and I just thought he was excellent. He's, he's somebody that you know adds to St Johnston. We know that they're a uh, real consistent side. I think every club would want to try and replicate that, but Danny Swanson adds something different to them. He's got that real creativity in the, in the final third, and he's been fantastic this season. He slots away the, the penalty, and you know he's made a big impact uh, since he's joined Saints. And this this one is just a, a real bit of class. Yeah, it was composure, good. wonderful sort of take and turn, and then the, the weight of the pass through for for Kane to, to put in the back of the net. He's a player I like as well. He's, he's been playing well this season. I think he's got a big future. Yeah, he's been <coughs> doing it as well for the last couple of seasons. Could be a big season for him. In terms of Ross County, talking about goals. It's not going well, is it, Stephen? Last week we talked about if Liam Boyce doesn't score for uh, Ross County, they don't score goals, and we saw him going off injured there. Yeah, uh, you know, I spoke to Billy Dodds earlier today about the injury, uh, and he thinks hopefully it's only going to be uh, three or four weeks for Liam Boyce, but it's, it's a hyperextension injury on his knee. You can see that medial ligament. and um, What's that in layman's terms? It just means he's, <laughs> he's overextended weeks. it. <laughs> You've um, had it before, haven't you? I've had it before, and it's, it's a nasty one, and you know he's lucky not to have had more damage. But, yeah, one goal in the last five games for Ross County. At this point in time last year, they had 17 goals uh, in the league, and they've got seven just now, and, and Boyce has scored six of them, so it's a, it's a concern for Ross County. It is a bit of a goal-scoring crisis at Ross County, you'd have to say, Michael, because they've got injury problems with Schalke, yeah. Curran, and now, obviously, Liam Boyce. And, you know, you bring in somebody like Chris Burke, he's going to supply the ammunition, but you need somebody to put the chances away. Of course you do. I mean, look, Ross County have done fantastically well since, you know, McIntyre and Dodds have gone in there, and they're going to, you know, they're not stupid, they're going to realise that they need to get goals from elsewhere on the side as well. But, you know, hopefully with uh, Boyce not being out for too long, they can start to get uh, some goals back into the side. International breaks come at the right time for them, obviously, Stephen. In terms of St Johnston, though, they'll be thinking, well, we've shown some great form going into this international break. It'll be about keeping it going. But all the signs are there for Tommy Wright's side that they're going to have another great season. We seem to be saying it every yeah, week at the but it looks that no, way. It's no surprise. It does, really doesn't surprise me. And, yeah, you're right, they've got a bit of momentum just now and the international breaks probably you're, come at I a bad time for them. Tommy Wright just cracks me up. You see him in interviews, he's never up nor down. He's just like, you know what? So that was good victory. Uh, we'll move on to next week, type thing. So, uh, yeah, I think he sets the tone at uh, St Johnston, uh, Mr. Consistency. OK, the Rangers Partick Thistle match would be overshadowed by the death of a Rangers fan on the way to the match. A coach accident resulted in the death of Rangers fan Ryan Baird. 18 people were taken to hospital, where three remain in a serious condition. Our thoughts are with them and with the family of Ryan Baird this evening. Commentary on the match itself comes from Rob McLean. Three changes to the Rangers team beaten at Petaudry last weekend. Clint Hill, Harry Forrester and Joe Garner replaced by Philip Senderos, Nico Cranchar and Kenny Miller. Left back Callum Booth and central midfielder Abdul Osman are back in the starting lineup for Partick Thistle, dropping out Adam Barton and Christy Elliott. On the attack, Wallace. Cranchar lost it and gets it back. Halliday. Cranchar pulling the strings and tries the shot at goal early on. Never looked likely to trouble Ryan Scully this one. 
Ryan Edwards looks to start something off for Thistle. It's been a promising opening to the game for the Jags. Adi Aziz against Philippe Senderos. Can he squeeze it in? He does. Wilson was there. And the looping header in the end from Edwards. An opportunity for Thistle right in front of goal. It was a tame header in the end. Tavernier. Mackay slides it through. And down very optimistically goes Jason Holt. Not a chance of a penalty being awarded here for the Edwards challenge. Cranshaw with the corner kick. Flashing header away by Erskine. And back out wide from Kenny Miller. No great pressure on the ball, and it's a good ball in from the Croatian midfielder. Now Wilson tugged wide of target with the aid of a deflection. Into a good area from Cranshaw. This will survive. Seeing plenty of the ball, Nico Cranshaw. Now Mackay leaves it for Cranshaw. Still going, great finish. The injection of quality that the match needed. And Cranshaw fires Rangers in front. After a difficult first half hour for Mark Warburton's team. That's given away by Devine. Martin Waghorn. Andy Halliday, 2-0. And there may be no way back for Patrick Thistle. Five minutes before half-time. Created by Waghorn, finished by Halliday. Miller. Cranshaw looking for a free kick. Play goes on. And Waghorn looking to set something up for Jason Holt. Making one of those darting runs from midfield into the penalty box. Couldn't quite get there. Lindsay's pass, finds Lawless, Chris Erskine, big chance, Fodringer makes the save, and again. Looked as if it was going to slither under the goalkeeper for a moment, back off the post, and scrambled clear. Mackay for Halliday, lovely touch by Mackay, and he leaves Devine in his tracks. In for Waghorn, not quite. Just a little bit too much on the cross in the end from Mackay. Mackay's pass, easily intercepted by Lindsay. Lost by Edwards, brushed aside by Cranshaw. In from Kenny Miller, Waghorn was close. And Holt is thwarted by Scully. Rangers looking for goal number three and not far away here. Good save. Wilson's pass. Finding Holt. Joe Dodu. Gets it back from Wallace. Having a go at Ziggy Gordon, and gets the better of him. Dodu's cross, Miller keeps it alive, Garner's header saved, and the block by Osman. It was Jason Holt at the second attempt after Garner was foiled. Miller scooped it up, and a good save by Scully, and a great block by Osman. Ziggy Gordon cross-field, finding Callum Booth. That's Elliot. And Sean Welsh flashes one wide. And it looks like being a blank return for Partick Thistle, 2-0 Rangers.
The 20th of August, last time Rangers won a match in the league. Michael, you were there yesterday. Just how important a win was that for the home side? Yeah, huge. I think that, um, you know, with the pressure that's on, you know, the manager and um, everything else that's surrounding the, the, the team at the moment, the one thing that's going to get to them out of that is three points. So, you know, the performance to a certain extent goes out the window, although they, they did dominate as the game went on, the three points is the most important thing. A recurring theme every week on Sports Scene, and there's a few at the moment, <laughs> but it's Partick Thistle's inability to take the chances that they create. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the first 25, 30 minutes of the game, I was really impressed with them. They got into some great areas, really good work down the left with Lawless and Booth, but they got into those areas and they didn't really convert wasteful. This one was Lawless with the second cross as Aziz came across the, the front post, but got nothing on it, really. And uh, they, they pressed Rangers high up the park and did really well. Erskine caused them a lot of problems. Again, though, getting into that uh, you know, punishable area and it came to nothing. It all really started to turn on a wonderful bit of skill from, from that man, Cranchard. Yeah, this is absolutely outstanding. I was glad to see him have an impact for Rangers yesterday. This is a piece of brilliance. What you'd expect from Nico Cranchard, what I think the fans have been wanting from him uh, this whole time, the start of this season, is an individual piece of brilliance. Um, but, you know, it's against Partick this one. I think that he'll shine the brightest in games at Ibrox against bottom six teams. Yeah, good play from Cranchard. Another midfielder for Rangers, uh, Andy Halliday. Mark Warburton admitting, Michael, that he was wrong to drop him for the old firm match. How did Halliday get on yesterday? I, I think he was, you know, very pivotal in the, the performance. You see here, getting in good tackles, covering back. He doesn't stop, he comes back and helps out at right back area with Tavernier. He blocks it, cuts it out plays the simple pass, you just watch after the, 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 the play breaks up, having a go at the rest of his team, not happy with them. You know, and I think that that was, you know, as I said, pivotal to Rangers starting to exert a bit of dominance in the game. Again, playing defensive midfield, but recognising that there's a chance to get forward, and he gets the goal from this. This was a fantastic finish. To me, he looked like somebody yesterday that felt like he was one of the main guys. You know, he started the season, and again, uh, you know, when I watched Rangers a lot, he looked like a peripheral figure. He looked like he felt he was peripheral. Whereas now, he's centre midfield, dominating the game, and I think he feels like he's got the trust of the manager back. Will Joey Barton get back in the side? No, I don't think he will. I think he's, you know, he's, his time's gone anyway. But also, when you look at the, 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 the makeup and the mix of that midfield, it looks a lot better now. How worried should Partick Thistle fans be? And is Alan Archibald under any pressure, would you say, Stephen? I think he'll be under pressure, yeah. I mean, the bottom of the league, uh, it's not been good enough. And they've been saying week on week that the performance level's there. You can't keep saying that without getting the points. They're going to have to start picking up points soon. Well, Inverness County Thistle arrived at New Douglas Park on a good run of form that had seen them win two of their last four games. The other two matches have been draws with both Celtic and Aberdeen. Hamilton Aki is the Premiership Kings when it comes to taking the lead in games. Holding on to that lead is the problem. Watching for us was Alistair Lamont. Hamilton Aki's make two changes from the side that drew with St Johnson income Lewis Longridge and Scott McMahon for Donati and Brophy. Inverness Cali Thistle are undefeated in their last four matches. Just one change from the win over Dundee. Ian Vigers in for Mulraney. Cali Thistle have won in the last six visits to New Douglas Park. Quite an impressive run that stretches back to 2009. An early chance there. And it was Dumboya's cross that almost uh, had Remy Matthews worried and he wasn't taking any chances as he touched that over the bar. Viger swings in the corner, Brad Mackay's header and Longridge was in the right place to sweep that off the line. A couple of early threats on the Aki's goal then. Captain for the day, Doogie Emery, trying to fire it out to the far side, gets another bite at it, Emery. Looking for options, eventually comes to the near side. Uh, Grant Gillespie is waiting. Gillespie onto the left foot, clips it in dangerously. Crawford didn't get much on it. There's Dakol on the rebound. And Alex Dakol has his first league goal for Hamilton Ackies. And he's put them in front. A fine ball in this from Gillespie. Crawford's run, if nothing else, caused problems for Fawn Williams. And he could do nothing to prevent Dakol from sliding in the opening goal. Well won by Seaborn. Craig Doherty 
in the Scotland under 21 squad named during the week. That's a good ball from Crawford to Emery. Can he pick out a teammate? Doherty involved again and Crawford. This is a really nice build up Daco for Crawford. Well, that almost deserved a goal. Terrific move from Hamilton Ackes. And Crawford almost providing the finishing touch. There's Warren challenging. And off the top of the crossbar, Remy Matthews. I don't think he got a touch to it. Corner kick's being given. And again, Warren causing problems. Solid challenge there, not so much from Longridge, easily beaten by Warren. Now it's Polworth in field for Draper, and it's Bowden, he should have done a lot better. The substitute just on the park, maybe that didn't help. But the goal was rather gaping there. Hamilton Aki's just beginning to build up some pressure in the Saki's back line for the first time, and here's Brad Mackay with the opportunity. Blazing off target, the fullback. And it's another half chance at least. Mackay throws it in. Matthews takes it well, he's hurt himself in the process. Gary Warren was the man challenging. The keeper on loan from Norwich. He took it well, but he fairly clattered to the ground. And eventually he's going to have to be replaced. Robbie Thompson will come on to take his place. It's a good header and a terrific save from Thompson. The first thing he's had to do, and he does it brilliantly. Draper got his head to it with some power. Instinctive save. In. It's picked up by Liam Polworth. Polworth with the equaliser. Deep into injury time. Cali Thistle surely have a point. The 50 50 fell kindly for Liam Polworth, but that is a splendid drive. And Robbie Thompson couldn't get down far enough to his right. Six minutes of injury time being played. Is there a winner in this game for Hamilton Ackes? Maybe not. Ali Crawford, though, trying to keep it alive. Blocked away. And now Cali Thistle come forward with Cole. Ball in for Dumboya. And a glancing header off target. End to end. Just in the closing seconds. It's a ball up. We don't we don't win the first header. I think it drops. Um, but unfortunately, the boy obviously picks it up and hits it in the net for 22 yards. And sometimes maybe all you can see is that maybe Lady Luck isn't on your side at the minute for whatever reason. And hopefully, at some point in the season, that will turn them. We'll be able to go and see these games out and go and take them one step further and go maybe go two nothing up, three nothing up, and go and try and win a game comfortably as well. We scored a, a couple of light like goals now, as you know. So. I always thought one, one was going to drop for us, we'll get one more chance mm -hmm. after that. I think there was six minutes injury time as well, so I still believe in them boys, you know, and it's a great finish by, by Liam Polwart, excellent, and that's what he can do. Our umpteenth uh, recurring theme of the evening is Hamilton Aki's failure to keep a hold of a lead in a match. Uh, seven times this season they've taken the lead in matches, and just once against Ross County, have they managed to hold on to it? What is that all about, Stephen? I don't know. It must be driving Martin Cannon mad. For me, I think it's probably a psychological thing. You know, instead of taking the lead and then saying, we need to hang on to this lead and then losing it, going and saying, let's go and get the second and the third goal, because they've not actually managed to score a second goal in any of these games, which is the most surprising thing for me. Um, but, you know, as a manager, you know, how do you put your, your finger on that or pinpoint how you're going to fix it? Just imagine where they'd be in the table if, after taking the lead like they did yesterday, they'd managed to hold on to it. They'd be looking at the Champions League. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might be. They might be top of the league if they'd managed to, to win all their games. But, um, yeah, I mean, yesterday, they played a lot of good football in the game. That's, that's a good finish. They, they, they are playing well. 
they, they just can't seem to go over the line. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good finish from Dacol in the end. But, you know, as Stephen says, trying to get that second goal, and Martin Cannon spoke about it himself, you get the second goal, you're able to relax a bit more. But for me, I don't think it's so much that they're, they're, they're sitting back and, and defending the lead. You see here more good play trying to get forward into the final third to, to get the second goal. It just doesn't happen for them. And ultimately, if you can't get that second goal, you're going to run the risk and have that pressure building up. But where it because seven times. I know, but you. that's the thing, where it starts to become psychological. When you don't yeah. get that second goal, you start to panic a little thinking bit. thinking about it. Yeah, and you do. The longer it goes on as well, the bigger the issue it becomes. Absolutely. Richie Foran deserves a lot of credit, does he not? Unbeaten in five matches, yep. and that was after a pretty wobbly run of form. Yeah, it was, and obviously it was after the game where they got, uh, you know, trounced at uh, Tynecastle 5-1 and he held his hands up and said I'm not getting the most out of these players so a lot of credit to him to come back and get a goal in injury time three minutes in injury time that shows a lot of character as well it's a great finish from Liam Polworth and as you said five games since the game at Tynecastle unbeaten games against St Johnston Aberdeen and Celtic in there so it's been a big turnaround and a lot of credit to Richie Foran for that as well How do you think he's managed that Stephen because you know He's got the same players, pretty much. OK, he's got Dumbuya in up front. Is it having more of a presence up front or is it just a collective I think it's thing? been a confidence thing. I really yeah. do. I mean, Inverness have got a quality squad. They've shown that over the last couple of years. Uh, I just think they had a bad start to the season. Confidence was affected and now they've gained momentum. And football's all about confidence and they're, and they're winning week, uh, you know, games every week. And Well, yesterday there was a draw, but uh, their performance levels have come up. We talked about the second goal being important <clears> for <throat> Hamilton Ackies. I, I, I think a yet another recurring theme this evening, Michael, is... Teams are crying out for a regular goal scorer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, uh, <laughs> they're worth their weight in gold. You know, guys that can put the ball in the back of the net, and uh, you know, and if Hamilton had somebody that was going to go out there and score 15, 20 goals in the season, you know, the difference. You know, we joked about it, but in all seriousness, if they had even picked up half of the points that they've lost, they'd be comfortably in the, the top six. Well, the Friday night football was under the Fir Park lights this week. Second place in the table up for grabs for the winner on the night between Motherwell and Hearts. There for us was Rob McLean. Motherwell are unbeaten in four matches and Mark McGee goes with the same team which drew at Fir Hill last weekend. Louis Moult has scored seven goals from only 280 minutes of football. Hearts are without injured midfielder Don Cowie but that allows Robbie Nielsen to bring back Jamie Walker. Jack Hamilton and Callum Patterson are both in the Scotland squad. Friday night football at Fir Park and Richard Tate in possession. Looks for Ryan Bowman. Fended away by Kitchen. Craig Clay deflection on the shot. And that is some save by Hamilton. Great reflexes. Clay will look upon this as a real chance to make the breakthrough. It came off Suter, and that was pure instinct. Louis Moult looking to add to his seven goal tally. In from McDonald, great touch and power on the shot, but disappointed that that was straight at the Hearts goalkeeper. Look at the touch from McDonald, which set himself up. He's filling that notebook as Robbie Nielsen. In from Nicholson. Up by Darno June. Patterson does well to keep that in, and he's won a free kick. Bundled over by Moult. That was a challenge the striker didn't need to be making. Nicholson with the free kick. Out comes Samson, missed it completely. Lasley looking for Tate, has given it away. Sam Nicholson, deflection and in. And Hearts have the lead right on half time with the help of a big slice of luck. It's a double deflection, firstly off Clay, then off McManus, and Sampson was going in the opposite direction, he would no chance. McDonald's layoff, Moult. In from Lee Lucas, it's a great ball in, McDonald off the bar, it's over the line from Moult, but the goal will not count. McDonald is furious, but he was also offside. It's a good decision by the officials, with Motherwell chasing an equaliser. Patterson, what? 
Now Nicholson. In from Sam Nicholson. Saxon got a hand to it. What a chance popping up for Jamie Walker. Real opportunity for him. Hearts look to keep it alive with Connor Salmon. Callum Patterson, what a hit! What a goal! Hearts take a two goal lead at Fir Park. And they could be well on their way here to claiming second spot meantime in the Premiership. Off the bench line, Lanesworth. Scott McDonald looking for a way back in here. Great strike! And that must have been so close. Looking for the top corner, and he can't have been too far away. Patterson's throw. Watt and Zoom. Tony Watt! Couldn't have been much closer to getting Hart's third goal. Back off the post, and then collided with Samson, could have gone into his own net. Somehow he was able to claw that away. Robbie Nielsen wants the job done. Muirhead with the corner kick. In went Suter. And then Oshum! A classy finish, which surely rounds things off for Hart. Curling it in with the inside of his right foot. And no way back now for Motherwell. It's 3-0 Hart. McManus, McFadden, and that will be a free kick. Given against Penny Kitchen's challenge. And the manager knows exactly what the assistant manager is capable of. It's James McFadden! And it's McFadden magic! Fabulous from Faddy, and it's a shame he can't celebrate it because the game has gone for Motherwell. But what a special moment that was. 20 minutes in the second half, you know, we bombarded them. They defended very, very well. We couldn't break them down. Um, but I think we put enough into the game to deserve something out of it. I think the 3-1 scoreline doesn't really reflect the balance of the game. First goal was a stroke of luck, really. I think Jack Cam wanted to thank for keeping us in the game at 0-0. A magnificent save, but once we got that first goal, I felt the pressure off the players a little bit. I felt they felt a wee bit more relaxed, because the like previous two games, it's been difficult to find the back of the net. A really good three points on the night for Hearts that took them to second in the table on Friday night. You're both there. Stephen, just how strong a performance was that from the away side? Well, there wasn't a lot in the first half. Motherwell were decent in the first half. Jack Hamilton saves incredible. Uh, and then they lose a really sloppy goal right on half time. At the start of the second half, I'd say Motherwell were the better team, creating chances. But Hearts were clinical. Uh, and in Callum Patterson, uh, you know, that second goal that he scored was absolutely outstanding. It's, it's an unbelievable finish from him, it really is. He was brilliant throughout the whole match, uh, driving forward as we know he likes to do. He's such a powerful runner. He found himself in a kind of centre-forward position on three or four occasions in the match. Probably should do better here. This guy's over the top of the bar. But, um, you know, his willingness to get forward and his athleticism are his key strengths for me. Um, and here you see him again in the position, in the centre forward position, looking in the box to get on the end of things. The good thing is he's never stopped moving. Well, no, and this is brilliant. This, you know, he's just had the effort on goal as playing as a centre forward. Look at his desire to get back into a back four here. Look, his head's down. He's sprinting as fast as he can, gets back and makes the back four up, and that's brilliant again defensively. From and this is just a piece of individual technical brilliance um, to hit this ball first time on your weaker foot, and he is two footed. Um, and put it where he did, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's That's un exact. Unstoppable. Yeah, it, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it was pretty quick, I think that says. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that goal was crucial because it, it, it sort of converted that dominance that Hearts had started to get midway through the second half into the second goal. Yeah. And you heard Robbie there as well saying that once you get those, that second goal, it allowed the team to sort of relax a little bit. So a couple of big international matches coming up. Is Callum Patterson Scotland's first choice right back now? 100%. Yeah, he played in the Malta game, the one five one. He was good in the Malta game, so for me, he's, he's the right back. Alan Hutton's not playing for Aston Villa, so 
he's, he's a great the, man. And the thing is as well, you know, a lot of that VT, you look at Callum Patterson in the, you know, the attack in third and the centre forward position at times, and we know that early in his career he played centre forward. Earlier in this season he was playing wide right. Right back is without a doubt his strongest position because, as Stephen spoke about in the VT, his athleticism to drive the team forward is his main attribute. Yeah. yeah. Hart's record against Motherwell at Fir Park hasn't been the best, but a great moment for Motherwell and otherwise poor night for them. And you're starting a petition to get James McFadden <laughs> back in the Scotland squad. Well, just only because he's in 49 goal uh, caps, it would be great for him to be 50. Maybe we can bring him on uh, <laughs> if there was a free kick in the Lithuania game, football. let him hit it and then go off again. But, I mean, it's a shame this goal meant nothing. Uh, well, I meant something to, to James McFadden, of course, but... Uh, it's vintage faddy, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible, really. Seems to be a lot of really good free kicks at the moment in Scottish football. Well, we may or may not see James McFadden in a Scotland shirt again, <laughs> despite Stephen Thompson's best efforts. I'm sure there's somebody efforts. at Motherwell who can sort it out for them, no? <laughs> <Good> <laughs> point. <laughs> in terms of the international matches, uh, Lithuania coming up, Gordon Strachan says it's not a must-win match. Michael, your view? Well, I think, you know, he's damned if he does and he's damned if he doesn't in, in this case. And I think that privately he knows it's a, it's a must-win. The players will know themselves that it's a must-win. If we're going to want to go and qualify for World Cups, Winning against the likes of Lithuania at home is a must-win game. Yeah, I mean, I asked Gordon Strachan that very question. Is the match against Lithuania a must-win match? Scotland have beaten Lithuania every time Lithuania have come to Scotland. And, and Stephen, surely if Scotland have any hopes of reaching the World Cup, these are the sorts of games that we do have to win. It absolutely is a must-win game. 100% a must-win game. And the reason that it is a must-win game is because the two games after it, Slovakia away, very difficult, and then down to Wembley. Uh, so you have to take something from this game. Something. All three points. The upheaval that we've seen with the England team, <clears throat> Mike, obviously Sam Allardyce yep. is now gone. How beneficial is that to Scotland? Well, I, I don't think it's going to be detrimental. You know, there's a level of upheaval uh, for, for England is, is, is going to be, if we can take anything out, uh, you know, positive. I think that the most, as Stephen says, the big thing that's got to be concentrated on is here is getting... Four points, six points from the next two games would be great. It leads us into that England game where hopefully if they slip up in any way over their next two games, it will give us a good chance to, to get something at Wembley. And I think if we go into that Wembley game having picked up seven or nine points out of the first nine, we've got to be extremely happy with that. Yeah. I don't think it matters that Sam Aldice is away that much. I really don't, because as a player... You're never on the pitch thinking about who your manager is. And Gareth Southgate will have them organised and they're top professionals. I, I, I can't see it having a massive impact. Well, I, I would agree to a certain extent, but the, what I would disagree on is the fact that, you know, you look at Sam Allardyce, he's got a particular style of playing. If somebody else is going to come in with a different, you know, perspective on the game and how they're going to play, they've not got a lot of time to change that around. How confident are you, Stephen? I know you were away for us when Scotland beat Malta. Obviously, we're top of the group at the moment after... One match played, still, we'll take anything. Um, against Slovakia, how do you rate our chances? It's going to be a very difficult game, uh, but let's get, let's get Lithuania out of the way first on Saturday. We need to win that and then hopefully get something from Slovakia. Okay. Anything. For the moment, Stephen, Michael, thank you very much indeed. After all we've seen this evening, uh, we should be hoping for something in the international break, that's for sure. Scotland against Lithuania will be a week on Saturday. Well, this coming Saturday live on BBC Radio Scotland. And then on Tuesday... Join us for more sports sound coverage as Scotland take on Slovakia. After all that, the Ladbrokes Premiership table looks like this. Celtic lead the way on 19 points. Aberdeen four behind on 15. Hearts and St Johnston joint third on 14 points. Partick Thistle bottom of the table on five. Thanks for sticking with us tonight. Apparently there's some sort of golf contest going on. We're back in two weeks' time. Until then, good luck Scotland from all of us. Good night.